lift on a But this wheel was incomplete. It didn't have iron bindings round the rim. It no longer had its massive hub. It didn't have an enormous extra weight of concretion on it. The test lift worked satisfactorily. But would it also work for the intact wheel with its five foot diameter and its accumulated weight of nearly a ton? It was decided that the wheel should be crated before it was lifted. It was no longer a matter of archaeology, it was now one of sheer mechanics. Lifting the big wheel had become a straight removal job underwater. The crating could only be done one side at a time. The frame, prefabricated on shore, had been tailored to fit the wheel exactly and was lowered into position on top of it. Cross pieces had already been prepared that would take the full weight of the two-foot hub when the wheel was pulled upright. Organization and timing were critical now. The trawler that had been hired to lift the wheel on board wouldn't hang about once it arrived. And so the big lift began. An airbag swung it upright, showing the heavy iron cladding on the rim. Some of the worst of the concretion was chipped away to lighten the overall load. Underwater, the wheel was relatively weightless. It was when it broke surface that the real problems would start. In its natural state, the wheel weighed over half a ton, waterlogged, it would weigh half as much again. The Spaniards themselves had had difficulty handling this cargo on board. And now, with the weather worsening, came the crunch for this expedition. This was a moment when everything could go seriously wrong, when the wheel was suspended between air and water. But nothing went amiss. Slowly and surely, the wheel was swung inboard. A specialist from the National Museum of Antiquities of Scotland was present to inspect the wheel as it came aboard, Dr. Hugh McCarroll. If, after inspection, he had thought the wheel not worth salvage or impossible to conserve, he would have advised them to throw it straight back into the sea. In the event, he expressed himself satisfied, and no sooner was the wheel on board than he'd started organizing a preliminary conservation program. Take a chisel to a lot of it, but I mean, you know, it's just not going to peel away. There's no natural break at all. 
It had been a difficult and delicate operation to lift something at once so heavy and so fragile, and it had worked. The wheel was taken to McGee University College in Londonderry, where the club itself had set up a conservation laboratory jointly with the college to treat the finds. It would be the task of this specially founded laboratory to preserve them in the superb condition in which they'd been recovered from the wreck. It's quite remarkable, it, it really is. Uh, I've never seen material of this kind from these circumstances preserved quite so incredibly. It really is a, a remarkable collection of material in a very good state of condition. By all normal standards, the wooden artifacts shouldn't have survived at all. But now the water which had kept them from decaying had itself become a problem. It would mean more underwater archaeology for a time on land. It's a little complicated because it is dead old. It's coming very quickly here. Um, let's just take it gradually. You don't usually get material like this off the seabed in this condition. The only reason I can think of is that it has not been exposed to the rather violent wave action over the centuries that material from a normal wreck would have been exposed to. Probably it's been deposited over with organic debris, this kind of thing, and this has aided and preserved it really quite remarkably. The wooden mess platter that Colin Martin had found buckled at the slightest movement, like a piece of wet plastic. It was half an inch thick. How it survived at all seemed a miracle. How Colin Martin recovered it at all seemed only slightly less so. That's nice. Right. Just fine. That's perfect. Good. Right. So it goes. Okay. The very club have shown very much from the beginning the concern for the objects as, as antiquities that is, is almost totally lacking in this sort of amateur interest. And the interest that they have had in the conservation side, again from the word go, restricting their interest in preservation, being pretty well uppermost in their minds, is quite unique. I don't know of any other instance of this degree of concern from the word go. There we are. Very frightening. Yeah. If you won't take this, it's not right to take. And then we've got a complete sort of length of the binding collapsed. The process the other side. It is really yes. The bellows, too, had survived the sea change from the shipwreck safely. They looked in absolutely immaculate condition, on the face of it at least. Gosh, it's fragile. No wonder that the appearance of the bellows belied their fragility. For like the claw hammer, the bellows had never been used. There were no telltale scorch marks at the tip of the nozzle. They had been brought on board the Trinidad Valencera brand new. The real work is now just starting, getting it into dry land has been a, a pretty severe effort so far, but the preservation, the conservation, this is now a major uh, objective. It really is a lot of work over many years, and indeed the, the future prospects of the excavation pretty well go hand in glove with the conservation side. Unless you can get your backlog down to manageable proportions, there's just no way that you really are justified in bringing more material out of the sea. And in fact, no more material has been brought out of the sea. The job now is to conserve and to record finds like this musket stock and to try to understand from it a little of what being a Spanish soldier may have been like with a five-foot wooden musket to hump. No drawings, however pleasing, can ever yield as much intrinsic historical information as a real thing. Real hard facts. That's what the Trinidad Valencera has yielded with her guns. Just take that figure of 5316 inscribed on one of the Ramiji cannons. It was her weight in pounds, but how heavy was a pound? 
there were different measures used throughout Europe. Here at last was a chance to establish once and for all in which type of pound weight the Spaniards assessed their Armada guns. By weighing the cannon and dividing the weight by the number of pounds, we'll get the weight of the individual pound and be able to identify it. That might seem to some a rather trifling achievement compared with the large pleasure of having salvaged for posterity such a magnificent example of 16th century Flemish gun foundry work. But every fact retrieved, no matter how large or small, all helps to add to our growing knowledge and understanding of that extraordinary European venture, the Enterprise of England. Thanks very much. Thank you. The weight is two tons, eight hundred weights, two quarters. And if we divide by the inscription of five, three, one, six units, whatever the unit is, yeah. we end up with a unit size of 1.0213 pounds. We probably find which precise unit that is now. But we thought the Castilian pound was the probable one. I can't remember the exact number of grams in it, but um, it, it looks very, very close. And uh, this is to be expected. But this means that all the other Armada gun weights we've got from only from infantry and so forth. We can now apply, we can now apply a real weight, yeah. which is great. There will surely be even more to come in the future from the Trinidad Valencera. But perhaps already the club members have gained even more from her than they themselves have yet realized. Well, that pretty well wraps it up for the season. The weather's breaking and we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish. Uh, we've begun excavation on this main square here and we've cleared with the airlift this rather larger square. From our point of view, we've certainly learnt a lot. I think from the club's point of view, um, its members have learnt a lot. All of us together um, have learnt that we need each other to achieve anything on this kind of operation. Before there can be a complete collection, there are all sorts of problems of conservation and treatment. But assuming that those problems are overcome, we would like to see them all established in a local museum so that the local people can benefit from them and tourism can benefit. And perhaps that I can take my children along to see what the work which was done and perhaps encourage other people to do similar work. Yeah, I'm a lot older than most of the members of the club. And uh, my children have been with me here and my wife and family and just like the other divers, their wives and families have been down and they have borne very patiently with our scurrying around and digging here and digging there and working airlifts and carrying bottles and complaining about the backache when we go home at night. And doing jobs here like building this shed and building these little bits and pieces, which we wouldn't do for our wives at home, strangely enough. It's been a very successful season. Uh, we've discovered the enormous extent of this site and in the very small area been able to deal with this year, um, we found an enormous mass of material. The potential for the future is huge, it's very exciting, but it's going to take many years. We're going to learn a lot more through this site about techniques of nautical archaeology and about the Trinidad Valencera herself and the, and the Armada.